Have you ever noticed that when you add dry hops to your beer that the airlock uh, basically begins to have more activity? And you think maybe you've introduced some oxygen and that oxygen is being pushed out? Or have you ever noticed that after you've added dry hops and packaged up your beer that the flavor of that beer has changed compared to when you added the dry hops? Well in this video I want to go ahead and address those two issues and shed a little light on the situation. So let's go ahead, let's get started. Alright, so first off, I first started hearing about the diacetyl effect uh, from uh, hops uh, probably back in January of this year listening to the Master Brewers Association podcast. Great podcast, by the way. If you've never listened to it, go ahead and subscribe to that right now. I'll leave a link down in the description. But back in January, they were talking about when you're adding in dry hops, it contributes some diacetyl effects. And the guys at White Labs noticed this, and so they went off and did a little bit of, uh, little bit of research to try and figure out why. In addition to that, um, when you add in dry hops, there's also been that conversation about whether it's more bitter or if it has any bittering effects or if it contributes any IBUs. And basically, I think that whole conversation has shifted or at least became about because the flavor of a beer does change when you add in dry hops. Um, at least mine have. So it was really, really enlightening to be able to listen to the podcast and them talking about how diacetyl basically occurs in the beer. The main reasons why diacetyl was being introduced to the beers was that there was additional enzymes that the hops contained that were basically contributing to breaking down the complex dextrins and maltodextrins so that the yeast could go ahead and restart activity. And of course, you know what happens when fermentation begins, you know, there's this growth phase where diacetyl is produced uh, or at least the precursors thereof, and you know the yeast just begin activity, and then after they're done, ferment the sugars, then they'll go ahead and clean up after themselves by you know um, uh, by transforming the diacetyl into other flavor compounds. So um, additional research had been uh, done, and what was interesting was in a most recent Master Brewers Association podcast. Uh, there was an interview uh, called Dry Hop Creep, or the podcast episode 98 was called Dry Hop Creep. And in that podcast, they had Luke Chadwick and Andy Farrell from Bell's Brewery. Uh, also talking was a Professor Tom Shellhammer and also Jason Perkins from Allagash. And what was interesting was the guys at Bell's Brewery were noticing that their hoppy IPAs that were dry hopped, heavily dry hopped, they had a difference in alcohol. Actually, they were going higher in ABV than they expected, and in some cases, they had to dump that beer. Or they couldn't, uh, they had to do something with it because they couldn't actually package it and sell it because it was higher ABV than what was allowed for those specific beers, or they, they were out of parameters. Anyways, they were observing some problems with their beers uh, at packaging. And then, so they wanted to go ahead and try and figure out why. They had a meeting with uh, the professor and also Jason Perkins at some time. They were, they were having a conference call. And what was interesting was they turned them on to a study that had been done in 1941. And actually, I have that study right here in my notes. You can actually see I highlighted it. It was actually introduced in uh, 1939. And it was by um, a guy called uh, Janicki. Um, some other names, uh, Koch Hastain, um, A. Parker, and T.K. Walker. Uh, it was actually published in 1941, so they got the published version. And in this paper, it was called The, Sti the Diastetic Activity of Hops, uh, Together with a Note of Maltese in Hops. And what was very interesting, what they discovered here, was uh, that this paper actually referenced a paper that was produced in 1893. That's 125 years ago. 
1893, there was a, um, a Bruin scientist called Horace Brown and also Harris Morris, uh, Dr. Harris Morris. What they discovered was that the beer, or the, when they put dry hops into beer, the, the dry hops, they, obvious, they also noticed this sort of uh, re-fermentation effect. They called it after-fermentation. Um, a lot of the current um, contemporary breweries sort of are referring to this after-fermentation uh, effect as hop creep. But back in the day, both in 1893 and 1939 to 1941, they referred to this too as the freshening effect of hops. And I think that that's probably the best way to put it, the freshening effect of hops. And um, what they noticed was, uh, well, they basically came up with, the guys in 1893 said, well, there's, there can only be three reasons as to why this happens. Uh, the first one is, well, perhaps the hops actually contain sugars that then the yeast start to eat and ferment, and then that's the effect, that's the carbonation, that's the CO2 that you see coming out of your airlocks. That turned out not to be the case. Um, the second thing that they thought about was, well, the hops introduced wild yeast because, you know, hops are out there growing on vines and then they harvest them. There could be yeast on those hops and then they... They process them, ship them off to the breweries, the brewers use them, dry hop with them, and it could contain wild yeast. Well, they tested for wild yeast and that came up negative. The third thing that they were checking for was that the hops contain a diastatic uh, capability or a diastasis. And this actually is the reason why you see after fermentation occur. It turns out there are four enzymes in hops. Now it's varietal specific and also seasonal so not all hops have the same uh, capability or diastasis capabilities in order to perform after fermentation. But what was interesting was the four enzymes they have alpha and beta amylase enzymes in there but the starches, the complex uh, dextrins and molten dextrins are a little bit too complex uh, for those enzymes in order to do anything with them at that point to convert them into sugars. But there are two others that are or have that capability. They can break down those complex dextrins and maltodextrins, uh, put those into simpler sugars that then the alpha and the beta amylase enzymes can go ahead and convert into sugars. Basically, they're debranching all those long sugar chains and then the alpha and the beta amylase uh, enzymes can go ahead and convert those to sugars. So they can go ahead and debranch them even more and boom! You've, the, the yeast have additional um, capabilities, uh, additional fermentables in the wort that they can go ahead and consume. So that's actually the bubbles that you see. This is a 125 year old technology that I just... I was like, oh, I gotta share this information with everybody because you know, we all sort of questioned where are those bubbles coming from, and now we know. So what was interesting was, with the latest brew that I did, there's a pale ale that I did, and so I fermented it for a week and a half. Activity on it had absolutely ceased. I learned about this information. I went ahead and decided to put it to the test. So I got a video that goes ahead and shows you what my gravity was after 10 days, um, and uh, basically, fermentation had been done after seven days, but I let it go for 10 days. So let's go ahead and take a look at that All now. Right, so here it is in the hydrometer. It's looking really nice, looking like a, a really nice sort of a pale ale IPA color. It is coming in right at uh, 1014. I don't know if you can see that sort of swinging around. Right, boom. There we go. There you go. There's... Okay, so... After 10 days, it brought the, uh, I had finished at a gravity of 1014. Now that was actually lower than I was expecting because according to Beer Smith, I was expecting somewhere around 1020. I was really hoping to get somewhere like a uh, 5.8 to a 6% uh, beer, but it's a little bit higher than that. So I had 75 grams of Citra, I had 75 grams of Southern Passion. I split them up, mixed them together, and then put them into each fermenter. So the fermenters, uh, I had uh, went on vacation, basically went to Prague, 
uh, toured Pilsner Raquel, came back and noticed that fermentation seemed to restart. So I was experiencing after fermentation, the bulbar was gone. Let's go ahead and take a look at that. Okay, so the fermenters, they've been on dry hops for a week now. We can see that there is still some activity going on. I haven't touched this at all. Seems to be less activity over here. But there is some. Over here there's more. Again, like I said, it's been a little bit more than a week. And still, with the dry hops, activity continues to occur. So I went ahead and I waited even a few more days. And even after every single day I went in and I checked it and there was still um, activity going on. It wasn't vigorous, but it was, it was probably three or four bubbles at least every minute. Um, so I went ahead and uh, put those into the keyser tonight. Uh, now they're cold crashing. I took a gravity sample. Let's go ahead and take a look at that now. Okay, so here it is about a week and a half later. Um, it went ahead and fermented for about a week and a half. Finished out primary. There was zero activity left uh, when I came back before I uh, put in the dry hops. And then now you can see on the same beer, after about 10 days sitting on dry hops, I'm down at 1010. Let's see. So it's gone down another four gravity points over the course of the, the 10 days. So right now I've got a, right in the, the fermentation chamber, uh, the fridge, it's now crashing down to, uh, as cold as I can get it. Usually I can get it down to about three or four degrees Celsius and then I'll go ahead and keg it up. But basically now we can see the 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 hop creep or the freshening of the hops has actually dropped that um, uh, gravity even lower. So let's go. Let me just go ahead and end this by saying that I'm gonna go ahead and put links to all this information down in the description below so that you can go ahead and uh, experience it yourself. Um, just to note really quickly, it was really cool uh, to see the guys uh, at Bell's Brewery, the professor and then also Alec Ash, uh, do some experiments that basically mirrored the experiments that were done in 1941 by the other group that they initially saw. They went through and they did several experiments um, let's go ahead and just briefly cover those real quick. Uh, they took the same sample uh, from a beer, placed it into two containers, and one for a control and then one with dry hops. And what they experienced was that the control remained stable while the dry hopped version uh, performed that after fermentation. The second experiment that they did was they took uh, the same beer and they added yeast to one and then they added yeast and hops to the other. What they experienced was that there was some activity in the one that they uh, added yeast to. So there was a little bit extra fermentation, but the ones that they added yeast and hops to had much, much more fermentation occur and the gravity was significantly lower. In the third experiment, they took another beer, killed off all the yeast in one before adding in the dry hops and then observed observe that the resultant beer had more residual ferment uh, had more residual fermentables, uh, basically uh, in that in that beer. So they had the the gravity had increased. So they had more fermentable sugars. Therefore, the gravity increased. There was no more yeast in order to eat up that sugar. So it just created a um, a sweeter beer. So the guys um, in the in the Bell's Brewery and also Allagash, they basically recreated the same experiments that were done inside uh, in 1941 uh, from this paper and confirmed the results. Uh, I thought that was very, very cool. Um, okay, so the point is um, the freshening effects of the hops is a real thing. 
Now you know why when you put in the dry hops, it seems like your beer is beginning to ferment again, or maybe you think it's air that's releasing from the hops or something. Now we have a definitive answer thanks to 125 year old research and I'm pretty happy to be able to close the book on that one. Now we know that there are two things that can affect the final gravity of a beer, diastetic uh, attributes of yeast, you know, those that are positive, as well as the enzymes that are inside the hops. So with that guys, I bid you farewell. I hope that this uh, was useful and interesting. Cheers.